private investigator Honey West focuses on her alias du jour. Today, she plays the role of a modest, unextraordinary housewife named Elizabeth Grady. Elizabeth Grady's brief walk through downtown LA brings her to the Pine Rise Hotel at the corner of 7th and Broadway. Catering mostly to the business class, the seven-story Pine Rise Hotel guarantees reliable wake-up calls, daily maid service, quality blackout drapes, and restful, quiet sleeping quarters, all at affordable rates designed for those on a budget. As Elizabeth Grady enters a medium-sized lobby, she sees the front desk clerk, above whom a large wall-mounted clock reads 11.15 a.m. A modest seating area features a well-used burnt orange sofa, two matching easy chairs, and a couple of vending machines in the corner near the payphone. The overhead TV is off, and the lobby's sole occupant, a 30-something white guy wearing a charcoal pinstripe suit, sits comfortably with his legs crossed while reading this morning's news. As Honey, as Elizabeth Grady approaches the elevator, Hey, sis. Hey, sis. She turns to see she's being summoned by the front desk clerk, located at the base of a simple wooden staircase, ascending to any of six floors above. About 15 feet behind Honey, the other customer in the pinstripe suit looks up briefly from his paper, smiles, then returns to his reading. Looking her over, the concierge regards the attractive blonde suspiciously. Where do you think you're going? My husband's room. Raising a dainty hand, she models her wedding ring. Third finger, left hand, and all that. Yeah? Room what? Room what? She opens her purse, takes out a room key, and shows it to the nosy desk clerk. 318. Then returns it to her purse amid her forged credentials, a driver's license and library card, which identify her as Elizabeth Grady. She clasps the bag's tiny metal latch and confidently takes her leave as the desk clerk calls after her. The rates go double. Oh, pff, the rates go double? Honey shrugs pretty shoulders at this economics news flash. So two can't live as cheap as one and continues to the elevator where she steps in and hits the button for the third floor. But as soon as the doors close, the seated man with the newspaper wordlessly exchanges a nod with the desk clerk, who responsibly grabs the phone and starts dialing. A moment later on the third floor, when Honey steps off the elevator, immediately to her right there's a large soda machine, and about 15 feet beyond that, the hall dead ends at an open window looking down at the back alley below. The window is flanked by an adjacent door on each side of the hall. The one on the left is marked stairwell, and the one on the right is marked janitor, which is about 10 feet from the soda machine on her right. Turning left, she walks a few doors down and locates room 318, where she uses her key to gain entry. Once inside, as she puts the key back in her purse, Honey instinctively notices the barrel of a 9mm pistol aimed directly at her from halfway across the room. In a split second, her perspective widens to take in the person holding the gun, a greasy-looking mustachioed thug with dark hair wearing a coat and tie, sitting in an easy chair with his feet propped up, resting luxuriously on a brown leather ottoman footstool. So, uh, you're Mrs. Grady, huh? But Honey plays it smooth. So you're the welcoming committee. You can call me Roger. Must I? Planting his feet on the floor. Now, uh... The thug, Roger, rises to a height of just over six feet tall. We'll go find the uh, long lost Mr. Grady, huh? And approaches Honey with his weapon trained on her sternum. Now, just inches between her and the pistol, she smiles casually at 9mm, then playfully makes eye contact with the thug. You're so forceful. Your name is Roger? Gesturing with the gun. Don't get cute, move. Roger points at the door. As only a lady can, Honey lively drapes a lovely scarf across his face and slams her fist into his forearm, knocking the gun to the floor. Instinctively, he bends down to retrieve it as Honey delivers a second sledgehammer blow, this time to the back of his neck, and Roger's limp body hits the carpet like a bag of potatoes, where he lay stunned just long enough for Honey to escape. In the hallway, the elevator doors are opening anew. Damn, this Roger's got friends. And just in time, Honey ducks behind the soda machine on the right and waits as she sees it's that customer from downstairs who'd been sitting in the lobby reading his newspaper. Here, now, on the third floor, Mr. Pinstripe steps off the elevator, turns left, and walks quickly down the hallway. Once he enters 318, 
Honey waits till the door closes. Then, in a split second, she runs to the stairwell, pushes open the door, but then turns around and nimbly climbs out the window and moves left. Outside, standing on the ledge with her back and hands pressed against the outside wall, she very carefully sidesteps further left while resisting the urge to look down. Now hidden from view from the hallway, she's relieved to see a few feet further to the left, within easy reach, there's an external metal ladder securely bolted to the building's brick exterior. And listening through the open window on her right, Honey can hear the men noticing the open door, then taking the bait and running down the stairwell. She climbs briskly down the ladder to the alleyway below. A moment later in the main lobby, at the bottom of the stairs... Hank, where is she? The two gunzels approach the desk clerk. Who? The blind. Well, she didn't come down. Let's look at the alley. Come on. Just as the two thugs run out the front main entrance, Honey West drops from the fire escape ladder, landing safely behind the dumpster near the service entrance at the rear of the hotel. About 100 feet west, looking down the back alley, Honey can see the two thugs standing where it opens onto Broadway. They don't see her, but they know this is Honey's only way out. There's an elegant metal pendant hanging from her neck on a silver chain, and Honey holds it to her mouth, pressing down on a tiny green gemstone as she speaks. Sam, I'm trapped in the alley. You better back the truck in all the way. About a quarter mile north, Honey's partner, Sam Bolt, lives up to his name, currently heading south on Broadway, already wearing his delivery uniform when he pulls up just south of the alley where the two men are standing. Checking both side view mirrors, he puts it in reverse, cranks the steering wheel clockwise, and quickly backs his 1965 Ford Econoline cargo van down the alley, coming to a stop with the rear of his van pulled up to a dumpster, and Sam's driver's side door roughly parallel to the service entrance. But the two men run to greet Sam where he parks his vehicle, and before he can exit, the mustachioed man, Roger, firmly depresses the door handle, preventing it from opening. And menacingly, the two hoods address Sam through the open window. What are you doing here? But in the driver's seat, the man whose name tag reads Isaac keeps a cool head and sticks to his alias. Delivery. Still holding the door closed, Roger turns to face Mr. Pinstripe. What do you think? I'll look in the back. He points directly at the driver. You, get out. Roger, with mustache, takes his hand off the door handle. The driver opens it and steps out. As Mr. Pinstripe rounds the rear corner of the vehicle, Sam Bolt is now standing on the ground, out of the van, closing his door. And as he turns to face the mustached thug, like a missile, Sam's fist slams into Roger's jaw. Meanwhile, behind the van, Mr. Pinstripe opens his rear door to see Mrs. Grady, who kicks him in the chest hard enough to knock Pinstripe off his feet. Then, closing the doors from within the van, Honey yells to her partner, All right, Sam, wagon's west! And behind the wheel, Sam peels out, leaving the two miscreants dazed, disoriented, in a cloud of their own painful confusion. Project Wasabi is pleased to present our audio adaptation of Honey West, Season 1, Episode 10, A Neat Little Package, directed by Murray Golden, written by Gwen Banyi, Paul Dubov, and Skip Fickling. Adapted to audio drama in late 2023. Subsequent narration, editing, and sound effects produced at Project Wasabi Studios, Hollywood, California, 90028. I'm your host, Brian Newberry. And now, we are pleased to resume our audio adaptation of Honey West, A Neat Little Package. About an hour later, at the office of H. West Investigative Agency, Honey and Sam meet with their 61-year-old client, an increasingly agitated Mr. Francis Grady. The proprietor of Grady's newsstand wears a slightly rumpled tweed sport coat and a pale blue business shirt, and his dark brown necktie is loosened at the collar. Francis Grady is a round, balding Caucasian businessman. His clean-shaven face looks even more confused than those thugs Honey and Sam left back at the Pine Rise Hotel. In Ms. West's small office, Mr. Grady sits in a black leather armchair roughly half the distance between Honey's desk and her office door. It's late afternoon now, and having changed her clothes, Honey currently wears a simple dark blue blouse over comfortable denim jeans. 
Facing her client directly, the 30-year-old private investigator sits on the front edge of her desk, resting hands on her knees. Also in attendance is Honey's partner, P.I. Sam Bolt, a lean 34-year-old military vet with short curly brown hair, currently trying to remain calm. He stands near the table with the sleeves of his gray delivery shirt rolled up to his forearms and his hands resting comfortably in the pockets of his dark blue work pants. Investigators want to know why armed gunmen would be laying in wait back at the hotel room trying to abduct their client. But the client's in question, a confused Francis Grady, just shrugs. Are you sure you went to the right room? Honey's getting good at this by now. Just as she did earlier with the nosy desk clerk, the investigator removes the room key from her purse and shows it to Grady. 318. That's the key you gave me. Well, I just don't understand it. I only wanted to find out if I'd left something behind at the hotel, my mail home, and then my wife would... But disappointed... Mr. Grady. Honey just shakes her head. We don't believe you. Oh, really? I, I just... Mr. Grady, please tell us the truth. All right. I don't even have a wife. This time, Sam Bolt speaks up. Honey found a gun in her face. Now, why? I don't know. And your newsstand's been boarded up all week. What? You're going to have to tell me the truth. Or we're just going to have to say goodbye. I don't know the truth. Trying to remember, but clearly frustrated. That's the frightening part. The confused businessman shakes his head. I've lost my memory. Come on, Mr. Grady. We're your friends. You know who you are and you know who we are. No, it, it's not like that. It... From what they told me in the hospital, it will clear up little by little. Hospital? That's where I've been for eight days. Automobile accident. I don't remember it. I don't remember anything. And then I got dressed to leave. I found that hotel key in, in my pocket. Reaching into his pocket. And this. He hands honey. A hundred dollar bill. Her eyes go wide, and she hands it to Sam, who holds it up to the light and looks at it closely. I never owned one in my life. Still looking at the bill, Sam nods his approval looks legit, and he hands it back to their clients. In the hospital, I... I kept thinking about my birthday. We had a little party. I can't remember anything that's happened since. And that was three months ago. I saw this overseas in the Marines. An injury on the head, temporary amnesia. Now you believe me? Why were you afraid to go back to the hotel? It's what I found in the trunk of my car. And when Grady tells them what he found in the trunk of his car, well, this time they're going to require proof. So the three people all drive back to Mr. Grady's house in Echo Park, asking their client to wait out in the van. Honey and Sam borrow Mr. Grady's house key, then walk to his house and do a thorough walkthrough to establish there are no gunmen waiting in a closet, bathroom, shower, or the garage or the backyard. Once they're satisfied, the house is safe. The alert investigators quickly retrieve Grady and bring him back. As they enter Grady's small, single-story house, without taking off his coat or hat, the elder client walks Honey and Sam directly to the door, which opens into the garage. As they enter, Grady hits the light, and the three are standing behind the trunk of a 1963 Sky Blue Pontiac Le Mans Coupe, which is understandably in need of a wash. I was going to fix a flat. Mr. Grady inserts his key. I open the trunk to get the spare. And removing a square-shaped box wrapped in newspaper, he closes the trunk. I found this package. Now holding the mystery box in both hands, Mr. Grady looks up at Sam Bolt. Would you open it? I, I don't want to touch it again. And when Sam takes the box, he puts it down gently on the closed trunk, unwraps a few layers of newspaper, then opens the box and takes out a neatly wrapped stack of bills. Flipping through it like a deck of cards, he notices they're all face up and in the same direction. As many know, cash is more fabric than it is paper. Holding up to the light, Sam carefully observes the texture of the bills, the white parts. 
and he confirms the presence of those tiny little red and blue threads so often missed by the counterfeiters. He and his partner exchange a glance of surprise. That's a lot of money. Then takes out an individual bill and studies it carefully as Honey asks Mr. Grady the obvious question. How much? $150,000. Neat little package. She looks at Sam, who nods his confirmation. The name's real. How did I get it? And the hotel key and, and the $100 bill in my pocket. Honey watches as Sam begins arranging the bills neatly back into their original stacks. Please, you've got to help me. What am I mixed up in? We'll try to find out, Mr. Grady. All I want to do is go back to my stand. All I want to do is sell... Newspaper! Newspaper! And the following afternoon, Grady's newsstand has reopened for business after a week of being boarded up. And instead of their regular guy, the older, bald, heavyset man, in his place now there's a thin guy in his 30s. Slightly altering his appearance, today Sam Bolt wears a Dodgers ball cap and a pair of Buddy Holly style glasses. Their large black frame thick enough to conceal a tiny radio transmit and receiver similar to the unit in Honey's necklace. Standing on the sidewalk in front of the newsstand, Sam Bolt wears a coin changer on his belt while continually holding a stack of newspapers. newspapers. As one would expect, most customers in passing politely ask about Grady. What happened to the regular guy? Where is he? Is he okay? That kind of thing. But most likely, of all the customers who inquire, men, women, black, white, young, or old, one newsreader will show rise above the average level of interest. That's the customer Honey and Sam will want to talk to. A few spaces up the street, there's a Ford Econoline cargo van parked inconspicuously beneath a shady tree, the front driver's area empty. But hidden in the rear of the van, in its tiny mobile surveillance center, Honey West and the client, Francis Grady, sit facing each other trying to avoid bumping their knees. The cramped mobile surveillance center is packed with a variety of electronics equipment hanging from above, some type of device that resembles a brass tube which bends at the center so it's shaped like the letter L. Its top disappears into the ceiling, and its bottom end is a lens which Honey looks into to monitor her undercover partner and his local surroundings. She speaks to her client directly in front of her. Well, so far we don't seem to be having much luck. But then, Honey spots a well-dressed man about the same age as Mr. Grady approach Sam Bolt. Newspaper! Wait a minute, here comes someone. Watching carefully, Honey can hear their conversation through the radio in Sam's glasses. Without taking her eye off the periscope, Honey flips the switch and puts it on speaker so the clients, Francis Grady, can also hear Sam's interactions with the newsstand's regular customers. She rotates the periscope around to Grady so he too can see the customer with whom Sam's speaking. Hey, you're new. What happened to Grady? Oh, I bought the place. Why is it new? Oh, no. What, he left so suddenly. Yeah, no. Looking through the brass tube, when their 61-year-old client sees the businessman depart reading his paper. Do you recognize him? Newspaper! Yeah, he's a regular customer. Grady rotates the scope back around to Honey. Oh, there's a shoe store down the block. Who looks into the lens, but speaks to Grady. It's the umpteenth person he's asked about you. You certainly made a lot of friends. Well, I've been on this corner a long time. Outside near the newsstand, Sam energetically shouts, Newspapers! Latest edition! This is starting to get old, in terms of some customer standing out as expressing high interest in Grady. Today could have been a cold lead. Fact is, the midday rush saw no more rise in interest than the morning. No rise out of anybody. This is a cold lead. Inside the van, Honey nods understandingly, but remains steadfast. We'll stay till it freezes over. She resumes observation of the surrounding area, when suddenly she sees a familiar face. And just around the corner from the newsstand, he does not seem to have recognized Sam. Sam. But from Honey's vantage, <laughs> you never forget the man who pointed a gun at you. Sam. She speaks to Sam's glasses. It's Roger the Hood from the hotel. Can his friend be far behind? And as if on cue, Roger drops his cigarette butt and squishes it beneath the toe of his shoe before approaching a dark green four-door sedan parked at the curb where a driver sits with the engine running. 
In the back of the van, wordlessly, Honey slides open the inside door up front, climbs into the driver's seat, starts the engine, reaches above the dashboard, and grabs the radio mic. Just pedal your paper, Sam. I'll be in touch. Putting back the mic, Honey watches as the suspect sedan pulls out and heads south on Columbia. Then, checking her side view mirror, she puts it in gear, makes a U-turn, then tails the dark green four-door, keeping a discreet distance to avoid being noticed by its occupants. <sighs> Sam hates it when Honey acts without backup, and barking into his glasses a large black frame. Honey, honey, honey. I beg your pardon, young man. Sam spins on his heel to see some ill-tempered, heavy-set woman in a business suit standing at the news rack, glaring at him. But adapting quickly, the young investigator smiles. I'm sorry, ma'am. Flirtatiously tapping his glasses to his teeth. I guess I got carried away. Clearly incensed, the angry businesswoman walks off on a huff, affording Sam just a moment of fleeting levity. Fifteen minutes later, Honey West is heading south on the 405, maintaining a distance of about four car lengths behind and in a different lane from the dark green car driven by the two armed gunsels. She tails the four-door sedan to the off-ramp for LAX and Beach Cities. But about a quarter mile down the off-ramp, rather than driving beneath the sign heralding Los Angeles International Airport, instead the suspect vehicle heads for Beach Cities. Another 20 minutes or so, heading mostly south on Pacific Coast Highway, the suspect vehicle suddenly slows and makes a sharp right into the parking lot of the Golden Lotus Restaurant and Nightclub, an upscale Polynesian-themed seafood eatery near the ocean about two miles south of LAX. Honey continues south on PCH for about three traffic lights, then making a U-turn she comes back north, once again passes the Golden Lotus, and about 50 feet north waits for the traffic to clear then makes a left, parking the service van behind two large freight trucks on a public parking lot near the beach. Behind the freight trucks, the smaller cargo van is hidden from view from the Golden Lotus, as well as the dark green sedan, parked directly near its front entrance, where the two gunsels are just now entering the premises. Once again, she grabs dashboard mic, switches to intercom, and this time speaks with their clients in the back of the van. Mr. Grady? Stay here till I get back. She exits the van, ensuring her door is locked. And about three minutes later, as Honey approaches the swank Golden Lotus restaurant, she walks through a quiet little courtyard where she notices off to the left there's a tall wooden gate covered in ivy. Not seeing any bugs or spiders, she puts both hands on the gate roughly at head level, then standing up on her tiptoes. Peers over the top, where she sees a lovely koi pond, its vibrantly colored fish, mostly orange and white, swimming just below the water's surface. At the far side of the pond, there's a small wooden platform, a little smaller than a parking spot, and due to how the terrain slopes, there's a wooden staircase with handrails leading up to the rear of the building. The water extends around the back of the property, where presumably either a dock or a marina separates it from the ocean. Taking a mental snapshot of what she can see, Honey steps down, turns right, pulls open a heavy door made of teak, and enters the Golden Lotus restaurant at exactly 2.55 p.m. Apparently it's before the restaurant opens for business, as all the lights are on and the chairs are upside down on tables. In the center of the wide spread out dining area, a 50-something Asian man vacuums bright red carpeting. Honey visually scans the expansive dining area, just beyond which there's a small performance stage for a comedian, a quartet, or a small music band. And cornering the adjacent wall to the right, there's a full-service cocktail bar flanked by two metal doored entrances and exits, presumably leading back to a galley behind the well. But in Honey's sweeping view of everything visible, Roger the Thug and Mr. Pinstripe are nowhere to be seen. So, the investigator walks to the center of the dining area, and approaching the man who's vacuuming, she notices she's about five to six inches taller than he is. Excuse me. Politely, Honey taps him on the shoulder. Excuse me. If you hear about the job, the boss is in there. The Asian man points to a distant corner where there's a closed door near an office window, whose white vertical blinds are also closed. But he's busy now. If she's here about the job, the investigator makes a mental note. Golden Lotus is hiring. 
Oh, I was supposed to meet someone here. Sorry, Miss. We don't open till five. Well, I just saw two gentlemen walk in. Oh, they in with Mr. Chico. Ah, a new name. And Honey makes note. Mr. Chico. So I told them you here? Honey thinks it through. Then... No. Smiling. I I'll come back when you're open. Yes. Politely takes her leave. And with a nod, turning on the vacuum cleaner, the custodian returns to his work. As she approaches the restaurant's exit, there's a vestibule with a cigarette machine, a water fountain, and two payphones. A digital clock above reads 3.01 p.m., immediately beneath which a bulletin board where local business owners can leave their cards for potential clients. Antoine's of Beverly Hills, Kessler's Music Store, Chrysler of Hollywood. Then there's a simple typewritten memo, now hiring parking valets, prep cooks, and waitresses. At the bottom of the memo, at a 90 degree angle, the words Golden Lotus above the restaurant's phone number are repeated as a vertical list across the bottom of the page, each repeat separated by a precise cut in the paper three inches in length. Honey tears off a tiny business card, slips it in her purse, and returns to her client, Francis Grady, out in the neighboring parking lot. Meanwhile, back in the city at Grady's newsstand, another customer is inquiring about Francis Grady. A worried 50-something asks Sam when the regular guy will be back. But shaking his head, Sam says he's the new proprietor now, and the previous owner no longer works here. Well, what happened to Grady? Sam dodges the question. I bought the stand from him. And gives the man his change. Now, don't worry, I'll give you good service. As to speak, Sam notices the man's clothes suggest he's flesh. Indeed, quite wealthy. His camel hair sport coat appears custom tailored. A diamond ring is pinky. Expensive looking shoes made from fine leather with uh, tiny black shoelaces. Extravagant, possibly Italian imports. We must have left some forwarding address. No, I just saw him one day and made the buy. Unlike the others, this customer asks very probing questions. And you haven't heard from him since? No. And Sam realizes he's speaking to the very contact they've been expecting. But the uh, stand's been boarded up for a week. Yeah, I know. Well, I had to give notice of my old job. Say, if I hear from him, do you want me to tell him something for you? Just tell him, Mr. Worriedly. The probing customer reconsiders. No, no, just, uh, just forget it. The customer turns to walk away, and Sam checks his wristwatch, then frowns, exacerbated. Uh, hey, mister. Yes? The customer turns around to see Sam holding his wristwatch at chest level, repeatedly tapping one of the buttons. You got the right time? Right time. Uh... The inquisitive customer checks his own wristwatch. But on Sam's wrist, what appears to be a malfunctioning wristwatch is actually a very well-functioning hidden camera. And three hours later, back at their home office, not for the first time, Honey is duly impressed by the picture quality of so tiny a device. Yeah, watch the camera, takes a good picture. The two investigators show their clients, Francis Grady, an 8x10 black and white image of the inquisitive customer who'd been asking about him. Mm. You recognize him, Mr. Grady? Sure, that, that's Charles Addison. Charles Addison? Addison, as in Addison Construction, the company that's built half of downtown L.A.? The big construction man? Well, I've heard of him. He puts up all the big projects in town. He must be loaded. He's a good customer and a very nice man. He once gave me a $10 tip for returning a wallet he dropped. He said, an honest man is the hardest thing to find in this corrupt world. As the three people look at the picture of the wealthy construction mogul, it's odd just how keenly interested Addison is in making contact with some newspaper vendor holding $150,000. Charles Addison is independently wealthy, stratospheric compared to Francis Grady and the other people in this case. Is it possible the $150,000 is a loan from Charles Addison to Francis Grady? In a box wrapped in newspaper? Highly unlikely. Perplexed, Sam drops the 8x10 glossy on the desk and points curiously at the black and white face of the wealthy millionaire Charles Addison. 
How does he fit in with a package of money wrapped in newspaper and two gunsels in a cheap hotel? We're not going to find out standing here. So what do we do? I'm going to look for a job. And with that, Honey West departs. No need to check the clock. Honey knows it's well after 5 p.m. and the Golden Lotus is now open for business. And no one is more surprised than the lead investigator herself to know she actually owns quite a fetching little form-fitting, sleeveless, tropical prince nightclub dress. But at a Polynesian restaurant, Honey's natural blonde mane just isn't going to cut it. And since she needs to disguise her appearance anyway, for this occasion, the waitress applicant is going in as brunette, posing as a naive, young, inexperienced airhead looking to make it big in Hollywood. After a brief excavation of her closet, Honey retrieves a long, wavy, black, curly wig with bangs, which she refers to as her Luana O'Brien. And Honey knows how to make its wavy ends drape across her collarbone just so. It usually promotes a favorable response among most men. And so it is, brunette hairpiece, face paint, heels, a well-timed phone call, and one hour later, the pretty young brunette now sits in the office of the restaurant manager, whose clearly unwholesome intent seems somehow incongruous with his elegant and well-decorated office, whose exotic decor matches the restaurant's tropical island theme. In the least trafficked corner of the office, a tribal wooden statue of wildly emotive faces stacked one atop the next. With its top head just shy of six feet tall, it stares back at eye level, unnerving most any adults who might stand before it. In another part of the room, a handheld shield roughly the size of a steering wheel, whose surface is an interwoven mesh of brown strands, not unlike the surface of a coconut. Most areas of the office feature various resources for fishing, hunting, and war. The office window is behind the boss's desk, above which a long hunting spear. On another wall, a primitive version of a small surfboard, a sort of boogie board made from some sort of smooth wood grain. More practical elements include standard office equipment, like a copy machine and a file cabinet near the office door. And somewhere, music's being piped in on unseen speakers, possibly the intercom on Chico's desk. But what most catches her eye is the second door, near the desk, and with only a doorknob and no other means of locks or deadbolts, Honey makes it for a supply cabinet. A simple observation of the building's basic structure suggests whatever's behind it can't be bigger than a small closet or perhaps a changing room. Behind his desk, finally looking up from her job application, the dinner house's sleazy manager, Eddie Chico, has no idea who he's dealing with. As it turns out, Honey too is a little surprised when Chico says in this case, waitress refers to cigarette girl. You wear a little dress, you carry a tray of smokes, you bat your eyes. Minimum wage plus tips, it's a nice environment, pretty music, free meal after three hours work. Where's the downside? Indeed, the restaurant manager is so desperate for a cigarette girl. When this pretty young brunette says she forgot her driver's license, well, Chico's never been one to nitpick. In his line of work, she certainly would not be the first employee paid under the table. And knowing of her stated interest in becoming a famous movie star, Chico assures the young girl that there are many Hollywood agents who frequent the Golden Lotus. And the lecherous manager predicts that starting tomorrow night, it's only a matter of time before she gets discovered. Starting tomorrow night, with a delighted smile, she bats her eyes all giddy. So then... Then I'm hired? Chico shakes her hand. Luana O'Brien, you got the job. Still holding Luana's hand in his. And a lot more, baby. He looks her up and down as she gives him a warm smile. I owe it all to you, Chico. Oh, don't worry. I intend to collect. But before he can get any closer, she picks up her cigarette tray. I better get busy. And blocking his advance with the large rectangle against her waist. I take my job very seriously. Yeah. She walks backwards, feeling behind for the office door. But Chico follows, now resting a meaty hand on her forearm. Well, I'll see you later, baby. And when Luana O'Brien finally departs the small office. Thank you. The womanizing staff manager smiles as he closes the door behind her. In the following morning, at the home office of H. West Investigations, four people sit around a living room coffee table. Their client, Francis Grady, sits on the sofa, quietly attentive, as Honey sits directly across from him. 
In the chair next to Grady's side of the couch, their office receptionist, known as Aunt Meg, leans forward and pours coffee into a ceramic mug on the table. As investigator Sam Bolt, standing with his own coffee, speaks to their client, Francis Grady. I checked the hotel registry. You never signed in. And if Grady never signed in, then how did he get the key? Turning to address Honey, Sam shrugs. I guess we assume the key was given to him. Maybe he was supposed to meet someone. Aunt Meg hands Grady the coffee with her reliably good cheer. How do you feel, Mr. Grady? Worried. Very worried. Sam Bolt shakes his head. If we could only pick up something to get started on. The lead investigator suggests another perspective. You suppose Mr. Addison might be the key? 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 Grady's eyes spark with memory. That's it. The key. Mr. Addison. Did Mr. Addison give you the key? Did he give you the package? I think so. Yes. Yes, Mr. Addison. With $150,000 on the line, it's no wonder business tycoon Charles Addison is so eager to make contact with their clients. Eager to make contact. Honey asks Mr. Grady for two more of his business cards. Anyone carrying this card is more likely to gain instant access to the wealthy construction mogul. Sure enough, when Honey and Sam present themselves at this hotel's concierge, the mere sight of Francis Grady's business card prompts a pleasantly surprised smile on the face of a tall, highly professional-looking 60-something desk clerk who says his instructions are to send Addison's visitors up immediately, whether it's Grady himself or representatives of the news vendor. Behind the desk, and identified by an oval-shaped name tag above his breast pocket, William puts the phone to his ear and dials the extension. a slightly confused expression, William hangs at the phone and tells Honey and Sam that Mr. Addison... Mr. Addison's in Suite 204. He doesn't answer, sir. Investigators make a mental note. Suite 204. Thanks. Stepping away from the desk to coordinate their next move, Honey and Sam sort of gravitate to one of four phone booths near the hotel coffee shop. Well... But Honey taps his chest and gestures to one of the elevators at the far side of the lobby. Sam, look. Sam follows her gaze just in time to see Mr. Pinstripe from earlier. The thug steps off the elevator and, still carrying his newspaper, dons a charcoal color fedora and discreetly makes his way to the lobby's exit. As he departs through an enormous glass door, averting his eyes and presumably trying to go unnoticed, this hood and fancy suit fails to see Honey and Sam at the other side of the lobby. But they certainly recognize him, and Sam Bolt says as much. The other hood from the hotel. How does he tie in with a man like Addison? Let's find out. They quickly cross the lobby, and a few moments later, now on the second floor, when the two investigators step off the elevator, the first door they come to is Mr. Addison's Suite 204. But as Honey knocks, the door opens slightly. And even though it's obviously unlocked, for legal reasons, verbally, Honey affirms to her partner. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. The two remain just outside the open door. Hello? They enter a very nice apartment, spacious and roomy. Mr. Addison? Its walls dedicated mostly to bookshelves and framed oil paintings. Potted plants taller than basketball players flank either side of the sliding glass door, which opens onto an expansive terrace. And in the center of the living room, a spiral staircase leads up, presumably to the master bedroom. Without comment, the two split up. Sam heads toward the kitchen, but as Honey approaches the bathroom, she can already see in through its open door. Sam. Quickly, her partner rushes to Honey's side as, staring into the bathroom, the two investigators make a grim discovery. With shampoo bottles and soap in obvious disarray, water everywhere, the soaking wet body of Charles Addison, still fully clothed, but face down in a bathtub full of water with his hands bound behind his back. Sam recognizes the tiny black laces on his expensive fine leather shoes. The one on the victim's right foot, which now hangs from the edge of the tub. Understandably, 
The two investigators spend the rest of the day answering questions from homicide detectives with LAPD. While Honey and Sam are not currently suspected of any wrongdoing, they comply with detectives' requests to stay in town should police require additional information. Later that night, after a half hour nap, Honey is in her bedroom getting dressed for her first night as the Golden Lotus's newest cigarette girl. During this time, Aunt Meg's in the dining room nursing a cream soda over a game of solitaire, while directly across from her, Sam's drinking green tea as he calibrates a tiny electronic listening device. As if suspended by a string, the lead investigator glides into the room gracefully, if not humorously, showcasing her attractive cigarette girl attire, as well as the pretty flower lei, which comes down to her elbows, the traditional necklace made of orchids, in this case imitation, that match the flowers printed on Honey's island-themed, form-fitting dress. Add to that, Honey's makeup and mascara thoughtfully applied to promote a sort of South Pacific flair and the piece de resistance is her long brunette wig, which completes a miraculous change in her appearance. Not to mention her age, she could now pass for five or even ten years younger. In short, Honey looks nothing like herself, as tonight she has become her alias, the wide-eyed, impressionable stargazer, Luana O'Brien. Here, now, in the dining room, Aunt Meg looks up from her playing cards. Well, if it isn't Polynesia, Honey regards her ally with a friendly smile, then turning to Sam. Well, partner? Mm, brooding, Sam looks up from the technology he's working on. I don't like it. I mean, you're going back to that hokey jungle restaurant. Well, it's the only lead we've got. Besides, what can happen to me with you just outside? Same thing that happened to Addison with the both of us just outside. I don't go swimming with my clothes on. And it might be said, Aunt Meg is looking pretty sharp herself sporting the office professional look, small stud earrings, and a conservative string of pearls draped around her neck. She wears a pastel yellow blouse and a powder blue ladies blazer over a matching knee-length skirt. The 56-year-old office worker carries a black fur wraparound shrug, affordably produced with imitation mink. And frankly, as Meg sometimes comments, one can hardly tell the difference. But in the wake of millionaire Charles Addison's violent bathtub murder, their de facto wise elder recommends caution. You know, honey, maybe just ought to drop the whole thing. I mean, with poor Mr. Addison and all. Poor Mr. Addison is just the reason why we will not drop it. Which reminds me, Sam, do you have Mr. Addison's picture? He takes it out of a manila envelope and hands it to her. Honey studies that picture Sam took of Charles Addison, the dead man walking with such little precious time on earth remaining. Ironic, his last picture would show him checking his watch. Well, if there is a tiger in your hokey jungle, this could be the bait to make him roar. Yeah, I'll put him in the mood to kill. Honey slides the photograph back into the manila envelope, ties its little red string, and gives it to Aunt Meg. Sam Bolt hands Honey the tiny gadget he's been working on. Anyway, this little listening device will keep us in touch so there'll be no surprises. She takes it from Sam and puts it in her tiny clutch purse for later. You know what to do. Of course. Cigars, cigarettes. Ninety minutes later, cigarettes. wearing her little jungle print cocktail dress, the pretty raven-haired cigarettes. cigarette girl walks gracefully among the diners at the Golden Lotus restaurant and nightclub. And with that canvas strap worn around the back of her neck to help support the large cigarette tray she carries wedged against her waist, cigarette girl Luana O'Brien sells cigars, cigarettes. One customer sitting alone at a cocktail table over near the bar is a 50-something administrative looking woman wearing a light blue business suit and a simple pearl necklace. She seems a little confused, sort of turned around. Everything in context, one might think she's unwinding after a bad day at the office. Though nothing so terrible a virgin cream soda cannot fix. Cigarette. At her cocktail table, the only other chair has her small black fur coat and her purse, next to which is one of those flat manila envelopes secured with a tiny red string. Fortunately, Aunt Meg is not recognized by anyone except, of course, Honey West. And in her respective role, each woman gives an Oscar-worthy performance. 
and here now in the extravagant restaurant as the cigarette girl passes the customer's table. Cigarette? Oh, thank you, miss. I was just leaving. The customer stands up. Oh, young lady, would you do me a favor and uh, deliver this to the manager, please? Certainly, ma'am. And thank hands you. the manila envelope to the cigarette girl who puts it in her tray. Thank you. But the head waiter, 42-year-old Lenny Jenkins, steps between the two women and politely, if not firmly, demands she give him that envelope. Thank you. Anything for Mr. Chico, I'll take care of. I'll oh. take care of Mr. Chico. Look at Brian. But the confused 50-something customer drops her fur coat on the ground. His years of training take over and reflects it. The gentleman bends down to pick it up as an equally well-skilled Aunt Meg turns around expectantly, practically forcing the professional servant to stop what he's doing and drape the coat gently over the lady's shoulders. But as he does so, Lenny is visibly annoyed to see at the far side of the floor that new cigarette girl Luana O'Brien, envelope in hand, already approaching Chico's office. But here at the cocktail table, with a beseeching hand on his forearm, the confused customer looks around anxiously, asking for an exit, prompting Mr. Jenkins to walk the lady to the door, who is already awaiting the camp as engine running. Meanwhile, in the office of the restaurant manager, Eddie Chico sits behind his desk as the pretty cigarette girl hands him that manila envelope. As he unties the little red string, when Chico slides out a picture of murder victim Charles Addison, his face goes white, and he looks at the cigarette girl. Where'd you get this? Some woman outside said to bring it to you. Nervously, the manager gets up and departs, closing the door behind him. And the new cigarette girl, Luana O'Brien, remains in the boss's office with enough time to peel away the adhesive cover of that tiny listening device Sam gave her, which she now attaches surreptitiously to the underside of the desk of Eddie Chico, who is currently out standing near the bar, hearing from his head waiter that the envelope containing the photo was brought by some strangely behaving 50-something office worker who just left about two minutes ago. The Golden Lotus head waiter describes the customer as wearing a light blue business suit with a small black fur coat. A lady. I took her to the door. She had a cab waiting. Did you hear the address you gave me? No, sir, I didn't. I sent Roger in. Eddie Chico returns to his office to see the cigarette girl now sitting on his desk with the tray in her lap, looking at the picture she holds of Charles Addison. Haven't I seen this man before? Something in the afternoon paper about being drowned in a bathtub? Angry, he grabs it from her. Get lost. Just like that? I told you to get lost. And Luana shrugs. Well, all right. Departs. Meanwhile, out near the bar, head waiter Lenny Jenkins tells the mustachioed thug Roger that Chico wants to see him, and he gestures toward the office just as that new cigarette girl exits. They wait till she's a little further away. Then, as instructed, Roger makes his way to Chico's office. And that new cigarette girl, a little further away indeed, as still carrying her cigarette tray, Honey has just exited the building, only to discover the exterior is not lighted. It takes a moment till her eyes adjust to the darkness. Then, careful of her footing, she quietly moves to get closer to Chico's office. Clumsy and awkward as it is, the cigarette tray must remain firmly in place against her waist. If she's spotted by anyone, obviously she's a cigarette girl. The first night on the job, she got lost. It's so dark out, anyone approaching would likely require a flashlight. And when she scans her immediate surroundings, Honey sees no one. Chico's blinds are open, and at a distance of about 30 feet, Honey can clearly make out Eddie Chico seated at his desk. He's leaning forward, listening to what? Is that a radio? He's talking, apparently speaking to someone on the intercom. Too far away to make out his facial expression, but it's likely he's no less stressed than when he first saw that picture of Charles Addison, a dead man walking. Reaching behind her right ear, Honey activates a tiny earpiece, but at this distance, the radio signal's too weak to hear his words. As best as she can see through the darkness, there does not appear to be anything obstructing her path from where she's standing now to a large bush of shrubbery just left of the office window, and quietly, Honey makes her move. In transit, and momentarily at a new angle, she sees there are two men standing in front of Chico's desk, that mustached hood Roger, and head waiter Lenny Jenkins in his comical black bow tie. Her footsteps remain mostly silent, and when she gets to the wall, 
a large shrubbery is between her and the window, and, under cover of night, partially obscured by foliage. For all intents and purposes, the investigator is invisible while enjoying a clear view of the three men in the office. Now she can just, ah, finally, her earpiece is now getting the signal. That's all I know, Mr. Stasho. Some dame I've never seen before brought this picture. Mr. Stasho? How many blinks? Ed Stasho? I tell you, they must be onto our connection with Addison. Unfastening the top button of her dress, Honey takes out her necklace, holds its sleek pendant near her mouth, and presses its tiny gemstone. You with me, Sam? About 200 feet exactly north, inside the surveillance van, her partner keys his mic. I'm parked right across the street. I heard everything. One and one is beginning to add up to two. Honey and Sam have never actually seen Ed Stashel but the violent thug's reputation precedes him, and there's not a crime detective in Los Angeles, public or private, who doesn't know the name. That's so right. Ed Stasio, Eastside Loan Shark, borrow 100, pay back 1,000. And if you don't pay back, you may find yourself drowned in your own bathtub. But the stakes are high, and it's starting to feel like they're poking the tiger with a stick. Honey, our tiger has sharp teeth. Come on out now. Sam, the hunt has just begun. He was on the intercom. Stasho's in that building somewhere. I'm going to see if I can find him. Stealthily departing her spot near the window, Honey heads back the way she came. But as she approaches that side door she had just exited a few moments ago, a large presence emerges from the shadows, and her path is now blocked by Roger the Thug. Hi. Now within arm's reach and grinning mockingly like a cat playing with its prey, Roger points a beefy finger at her face. I've been looking for you. How flattering. Uh, no tricks. Of course not. She hands him the second most expensive item in the tray. Have a cigar. The Monte Cristo. Why not? Roger smiles. Why not indeed? Not that he's going to let her go. But Roger's not about to turn down a free Monte Cristo either. Muscle memory as he drops its wrapper to the ground puts the cigar between teeth and lips while drawing a tiny lighter from his pocket and with the flick of his thumb sparks an even tinier flame which he carefully brings to the tip of his cigar just as a cigarette tray suddenly flies up boom smashes Roger's face hard meanwhile out in the surveillance van Sam Bolt is urgently trying to reach his partner honey answer but she's a little busy right now as Roger jumps to his feet instantly triggering honey's martial arts training and as he lunges at her in less than a second, she clamps down on his left wrist using both hands like a vice. Dropping to the ground, she kicks straight up, catching him in the waist with her right foot. She shoves, abruptly transferring his momentum, where, just for an instant, he sails through the air and just as quickly lands with a hard thud on his back. But before he can get up, she clenches the fist and clubs the back of his head as hard as she can. And once again, Roger goes out like a light. Quickly draping the canvas strap around the back of her neck, Honey correctly connects the ends to the cigarette tray, which she positions against her waist. Then, kneeling to the ground, she collects her inventory, brushes away bits of dirt, and with some degree of order, arranges it all back into the large tray. Relieved this time Roger didn't bring any backup, the investigator straightens her wig, mindfully slows her breathing, and calmly regains her composure just as she re-enters the building. Now, sauntering nonchalantly through the extravagant dining room, cigarette girl Luana O'Brien casually makes her way back to Eddie Chico's office. She enters without knocking, where she's greeted by the head waiter Lenny Jenkins. Come in, Miss O'Brien. Who closes the door behind her. Or is it Mrs. Grady? With his sidearm trained on Honey's center mass. Or Luana's center mass. Or, well... What's in a name? Exactly. Gesturing to the left, Eddie Chico points to the green sofa opposite his desk. All right, get over there and sit down. His desk, behind which another man, a third man, mostly silhouetted with his back facing the group, stands at the office window with his hands in his pockets as he quietly surveys the busy dining area. All the happy people seated comfortably, enjoying their cigars, drinks, and meals. With the door being guarded by restaurant manager Eddie Chico and head waiter Lenny Jenkins, who is armed, and no other cards to play, Honey lugs her big cigarette tray across the exotically decorated office and takes a seat on the green sofa from her perspective on its far right, facing Chico's desk, where this mystery man stands there with his back turned, playing pocket pool. 
Now seated with a bulky cigarette tray on her lap, she adjusts the lay of orchids covering her bosom, moves the sleek little amulet at the end of her silver necklace, then crossing her legs makes herself comfortable. Well, isn't this cozy? So honey is right near the office door. Watching her like a hawk, the head waiter opens his sports coat and holsters the weapon beneath his left armpit. Then he gestures at Honey's brunette wig. Take off the wig. Keeps me warm. With a firm look on his face, he nods to the tall silhouette behind Chico's desk. Mr. Stasha wants to see you without it. Take it off. Mr. Stasha. Honey complies, and removing the extravagant black wig, she shakes her head vigorously, releasing healthy tresses of blonde hair which drape naturally across her well-defined shoulders. And the man who hired this woman, restaurant manager Eddie Chico, laughs nervously. Huh, that just goes to show you. You don't know what you're getting these days. Right, Mr. Stashel? Standing behind the desk, when the silhouetted man finally turns to face those present, Honey manages to contain her surprise as she recognizes it's Mr. Pinstripe. Indeed, Mr. Pinstripe is Ed Stashel. You're Mr. Stashel? Who'd ever expect you to front as one of your own hoods? In the van across the street, with his headset on, Sam Bolt ensures he's recording on both tape decks, praying Ed Stashel says something to incriminate himself. But as for Honey's question, who would expect him to front as one of his own hoods? Stashel's as cool as ice. Practically nobody. Do you always do your own dirty work? Like Mr. Addison, I mean. Only in special cases. And 150 grand makes this real special. Adjacent to the desk, on a bookshelf recessed into the wall, an assortment of bottles and glasses passes for a bar, from which Stashel grabs bourbon and, turning toward Honey, gestures to her cigarette tray. Get rid of the tray. Relax. Have a drink. He pours a glass, about a third full, and hands it to her. Thank you. He then pours one for himself as Honey, holding her own drink, leans forward, resting an elbow on her knee, and, now in conversation mode, tilts her head slightly as curiosity lines her brow. How did Mr. Addison get involved? Casually, he steps around to the front of the desk. He needed a hundred grand in a hurry, and I gave it to him. He takes a seat on its front edge, now looking down at the woman sitting on the couch. At a reasonable interest rate, no doubt. Stashel takes a swig. No doubt. Fifty grand for thirty days. But Mr. Grady had the money. Why kill Mr. Addison? Addison said he gave Grady the money to deliver. Grady, he disappears. That's bad for business. I have a reputation to maintain. And Mr. Addison was the object lesson. That's right. And if this punk Grady has the dough, can't sit on it long. Bingo! Out in the van, they got it on tape. Sam grabs his pistol, jumps out, makes a beeline for Eddie Chico's office, where, at this exact second, still calmly sitting on the desk, the mobster, Ed Stoschel, puts down his drink. I've enjoyed our little talk. All things must come to an end. Then, standing up completely. I'm afraid so. The mobster addresses his two men at the door. Door the garden's locked. Nobody will bother you. The matter of fact that takes the glass out of Honey's hand. Take her to the lake. The lake? It's a koi pond that's three feet deep. Honey's seen deeper bathtubs. You do have a thing about water, don't you? Get her out of here. Standing on either side of Honey, the two thugs restrain the woman's arms, and when Ed Stoschel opens that second door near Chico's desk, Honey realizes it's not a closet. Come on, baby. Let you take a swim, huh? The thugs force her in, and as the door closes behind them, Honey finds herself being hurried down a dimly lit tunnel. Meanwhile, now alone in Chico's office, the mobster turns to leave through the regular office door, just as Sam Bolt storms in with his pistol drawn safety off. But in this split second, Stoschel's now behind the door, and getting the jump on Sam, he clenches the fist, 
An hammer blow as the investigator's gun knocked him to the floor. Then behind Sam, Stashel sucker punches him in the kidney. But when the mob boss bends down to pick up the gun, Sam kicks it hard out of his hand. And before Stashel can stand up straight, the ex-marine belts him even harder in the jaw. Stunned, Ed Stashel stumbles back, a bit disoriented. And Sam hits him again, knocking him back against the wall, where the criminal removes an artfully mounted tribal scimitar, basically a curved machete and turns towards Sam, who reflexively throws up his arms, jumping back just as the mobster swings the blade, missing the investigator's abdomen by inches. And now it's Sam who is in retreat, backing into that corner of the room with a life-size wooden statue of wild faces. With a lethal scimitar held over his head, Ed Stoschel swims down just as Sam ducks for his life, and the blade gets wedged, stuck in the wooden statue. The mobster momentarily disarmed, the private investigator seizes the opportunity with a non-lethal uppercut to the diaphragm. Facing him straight on, the investigator swiftly reaches under Stashel's armpit. Extending his hand behind, he grabs the back of his adversary's belt, and when he flips him over his back, Stashel violently slams against the hard ground with the impact of an auto wreck, leaving a badly beaten Stashel gradually recovering. The investigator exits through that smaller door near the desk in search of his partner, who is now at the tunnel's opening, where L.A.'s warm night air is as dark as that koi pond 20 feet below. The henchmen have brought Honey to a wooden staircase leading down to the water, solid and in good repair with sturdy handrails, but it's only wide enough for one person at a time, presumably to keep better control of their prisoner. Walking single file, the two thugs deny their captives' escape by Lenny, the waiter, walking in front, occasionally looking back at Honey, and Eddie Chico picking up the rear. Descending now, as they approach the landing, Lenny glances back, then returns his focus forward, down the steps. And when he does, Honey grabs both handrails, and when her feet leave the ground, Honey's firm kick packs enough strength to knock Lenny, tumbling down the remaining three steps, where he breaks the wooden fence at its base. Honey makes a run for it. Three feet of water helps she can swim to safety. But when Eddie Chico catches up with her at a tiny wooden platform at the water's edge, she stops and turns around to face him, standing now with the water at her back and Eddie Chico between her and dry land. And in the blink of an eye as he lunges for her, she grabs his fingers and spins on a heel. And with the front of his body pressed against her back, ew, Using his forward momentum, she ducks, yanks his arm under her, and lets go, which swiftly sends the restaurant manager right over her and into the drink. Honey turns around just as Lenny, the waiter, slams into her. She grabs him, and they both fall in the water about waist deep. But behind Honey, the restaurant manager restrains her hands behind her back, as in front of her, the head waiter grabs her head and shoves it under the water, just as seemingly out of nowhere, Sam Bolt punches the head waiter in his temple with Honey's head popping out of the water, gasping precious air, as behind her, Sam slugs Eddie Chico twice. <laughs> Ed Stoschel's running down the stairs now, coming to the aid of his gunsels. Up to their waists in pond water, Honey grabs Lenny Jenkins by the crotch and squeezes as hard as she can. But as Ed Stoschel comes closer, Honey lets go, stands up straight, then facing the waiter straight on, she bookends his head in both her hands, and with a thumb over each eyelid, she thrusts him in and forward, trying to gouge out both his eyes. But when the waiter struggles, Honey is only half successful, leaving the newly branded Cyclops to frantically stumble around, clutching haplessly at the moist, open eye socket, now painfully exposed to the elements, rendering Lenny Jenkins immobilized. During this time, Sam's opponent, restaurant manager Eddie Chico, gives as good as he gets, and the two men exchange half a dozen blows in as many seconds. When Sam turns and jabs his left elbow up, he catches Chico square on the jaw, knocking the criminal unconscious. Luckily for Chico, mostly on dry land. Sam turns just in time to see Ed Stoschel punch Honey right between the eyes. But she takes it like a champ as Sam wrenches Stoschel's arm behind his back. And Honey helps as they both dunk his head under the water repeatedly, just enough to take the fight out of him. <laughs> sort of restraint by baptism. Honey and Sam drag a physically drained Ed Stoschel to the water's edge and lay the exhausted criminal on the marshy ground, hands behind his back, as they sit over him and await police to arrive. You all right, honey? Yeah. Well, we finally got ourselves that tiger after all, didn't we, Sam? Sam pats Stashel on the head and vigorously rubs his wet hair, much as one might rub a wet dog. Later, after the arrest of Ed Stashel and his thugs, 
as police are wrapping up the investigation. Honey and Sam, positioned side by side, sit on the edge of that tiny wooden pier, slowly drying off al fresco as they dangle their feet leisurely just above the water's shimmering surface. Fights, knives, guns, hoods. Boy, what a life. That's detective biz. Ah, speaking of business, what kind of arrangements did you make with our friend Grady? For uh, services rendered, $100 bill. A hundred dollar bill? Oh, shaking his head, Sam just rolls his eyes, frustrated. Stasho's rate was 50 thou for 30 days. Demure, avoiding eye contact, she adjusts the orchids draped from her shoulders. Sam, about that hundred dollars. Oh, no, wait a minute, honey. Poor Grady. Looking at Sam, she blinks beautiful blue eyes of melancholy. All this work and no pay? She affectionately leans into his shoulder. Nice, Sam. And pecks a kiss on his cheek. What am I gonna do with you? Buy me a Polynesian dinner. I'm hungry after all that swimming. <laughs> This concludes our audio adaptation of Honey West, A Neat Little Package, based on the stories and characters by Skip and Gloria Ficklin. If you enjoyed this program, please share it with your friends and family. For other audio dramas, such as the one you just heard, as well as original non-fiction documentary podcasts, we hope you'll visit us online at projectwasabi.com. I'm Brian Newberry. On behalf of Project Wasabi, Thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you soon.